Thank you. Good morning. Um, I got a lot of content to cover, so I'm going to get right to it. Um, so this talk was originally broken down into four parts, um, but I'm actually going to skip the first one because I think folks are pretty apt to go out and look at documentation. The first part of this um, is all about getting data into Elasticsearch and OpenSearch. Um, so if you're interested in that, go ahead on out to Elasticsearch documentation, OpenSearch documentation, or even Solar, um, and they will tell you how to get the geospatial data in. This talk is scoped down to talking about the data structures inside of Lucene for spatial indexing um, that enable both the search and the analytics. So I'm going to go into those data structures. Some of this is a bit of a rehash. If you saw this talk at all from ApacheCon, uh, like 2019, 2020, 2019, I did some of this then, but this talk will be updated to talk about some of the new data structures and updates uh, that just are about to come out and actually we see 9.4. Uh, so let's open up the hood. Um, you know, th there's a wide range of knowledge here from front end to back end. So um, some of this might be uh, old hat for some of you, but uh, I just figured I'd sort of level set on the data structures itself inside of Lucene. Um, so Lucene is cele well celebrated its 20th anniversary. It was originally founded as a text-based search engine. Uh, for those that don't know what Lucene is, it's an API, one of the longest running Apache Foundation projects. It's an API for search, um, and in particular, unstructured text search. Um, so let's talk about the data structure that was originally developed for Lucene and why it didn't work for numerical data, let alone geospatial data. Then we'll talk about what improvements were made to those data structures to get to at least numerical support and some early geospatial data support. And then we'll talk about what we did in 2018, 19-ish, and what's coming past that. Um, so inverted index, for those of you that uh, are unfamiliar, you're probably at least familiar with the index in the back of a book that is alphabetically sorted terms and the pages that those terms fall on. That's all an inverted index is. Um, so the data structure in Lucene is broken down into two primary data structures, something called a terms dictionary and a postings list. The terms dictionary is no different than your alphabetically sorted terms, and the postings list is no different than the page number that those fall on. So if we look at two documents, and they're very simple, small documents. Uh, first one, you know, every letter of the alphabet, and the boxing wizard jumps quickly. And then the second one has some similar words, but with different stems and postfixes. Um, quick jumping springtails on cool water. If we want to put this inside of a dictionary inside of a book or a term or a uh, uh, inverted index like Lucene, you'll see it's uh, lexicographically sorted inside the terms dictionary, and then the document ID that those fall into um, is inside the is placed inside the postings list. So, like the open source community went bananas on this, right? Hey, we have unstructured text. It's super simple. The data structures work well. Um, and then a few years later, what about numbers? Because now we just handle unstructured text, but if we want to do scientific analysis or any kind of numeric search, um, you know, it's not supported. So that was the next step in the evolution, was to be able to add numerics. But software developers being lazy didn't want to write a data structure specifically for numerics, since the inverted index was already there. Let's reuse something that's already there. Um, so, and you know, to his credit, brilliant uh, committer, Uwe Schindler, said, well, let's look at tries, right? Which basically takes your numerics, and in this case, I'm just gonna look at integers, right? Which is um, four bytes, and I'm gonna take the binary of those integers, and I'm literally gonna break them down into lexicographically sorted numerics, right? So your terms dictionary, but, but prefix stemmed. So I'm gonna go through it bit by bit, and the one goes into the one, and naturally, everything that's prefixed with a one, which in the normal case would be negative numbers, um, so we actually uh, switch it, right? So we bit flip the first one. So zeros become negative in the terms dictionary so that it's actually numerically sorted correctly. So that's a little bit of a nuance here, but in this case, they're all positive integers, so one is gonna have all the documents, one through five, and then I continue, one zero is gonna be two, three, and four, um, and so, so you know, Lucene community went bananas again because, hey, now we can do numerics and we can do free text search. But then geo people were not happy because this doesn't work well for geospatial data. Why? Something called dimensionality, right? So most of you folks are probably aware of that. So what, what do we do to handle the dimensionality issues of now two dimensions? Well, the brute force way is to just have two numerics. Well, that doesn't work so well because now you want to start doing 
geometry intersections and all that, it becomes problematic. Trying to search across two different data structures or two different inverted index for two different fields and then munge them together becomes a nightmare. It's doable because it's just software, but you know, it, at a price. So let's look at it, what happened here? Well, geohashes happened. And we just said, okay, let's take a geohash, break it down into its binary representation, base32 encoded, and start to split the Earth so that it can be reduced down to one dimension. So how do geohashes work? Well, you split along the y-axis for the first bit, x-axis for the second bit, then recurse, y, x, y, x, y, x. So that's the bit interleaved. Um, so it, when you split across the y-axis, one becomes the northern hemisphere, zero is the southern hemisphere. So now let's look at this example where we have five documents all in the northern hemisphere. Well, the terms dictionary for one holds all the documents in the postings list. Then we recurse, one, one being the upper right only holds documents one and five, and then one, one, one also holds one and five, and then if we split down to one, 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 zero, we actually get down to point one. Um, so this is no different than rasterizing all of your points, which is just a way of bucketing things. So as you can imagine, you're at the mercy of your resolution of how far you traverse, right? So the, the lower the resolution, you know, everything gets, gets conflated down into a single point. I get down to 32, then I make it conflated down to 100 points. So precision matters because if you want to talk about getting to one point, you have to use ancillary data to actually find that one point. You can't just use the spatial index in this approach. Um, so that's kind of illustrated here, right? So if I sneeze on the monitor and I have these points up here on the map, and then I do a radius search, which is how distance search was calculated in Lucene, I literally broke it down into a circle. Then we have to do basically a quad tree encoding of the, pre of the, the circle, and then those become our terms and our terms dictionary and our buckets or the postings list. So if we traverse, I'm just gonna arbitrarily pick one zero here. I don't know if that's actually accurate, so nobody test me on that one there. <laughs> Probably isn't. But one zero would have document two, three, and four. I then have to recurse again to get down to document two, and then further to get down to document four. Um, so you can imagine that based on the depth of your tree, this is incredibly wasteful, and it's very expensive to do, because now all of my big geometries have to be reduced down into all of these cells. Yeah, doesn't work well. It works, right? But it doesn't work like optimally, which is what most uh, scientific analysis needs. Okay, so then what about geoshapes? Okay, well I showed you points example, and I had a video here to kind of break it down, but I don't know if it all, it doesn't look like it's actually started. Oh, maybe, yeah, Should I clicking on it? Yeah, there we go. Okay, so if you remember Netscape Navigator days, God, I'm dating myself probably here, but this is how images worked on the internet really way back during modem dial-up, if you remember. Those images would slowly come in as more data was streamed, and all it was doing is it was streaming through the stack, right? Higher resolution, higher resolution, and filling in all of those cells. So you can see at the lowest resolution when we started this, super blurry because there's a fewer number of cells. But then as I go through the number of iterations, which I'm sure is really hard to see back there, which I think was 20,000 or so, I finally get down to some semblance of a resolution here. So that's how shapes worked inside the geo index. You take an arbitrary polygon and then you just recurse through that polygon and whatever cells fall in. So if Negan here is document six, well then all of the cells that represent Negan would have to go into the terms dictionary. So we're happy because it works, but it's a lot of data. And this is what we would see, and we get customer requests saying, why does it take three days to index Russia? So we're sad. Not only that, we have to throw all of these parameters in there to tune the index as an answer to customers saying, well, how can I get it down from two days indexing the Russia polygon down to a day and a half. Okay, well, let's throw some slot factors in there and then let's optimize for points only if you want to use that same data structure for points. It's a nightmare. You have all these parameters, right? And you say, well, no, just change this parameter. Cool, but that's an expert only option. Horrible experience. Bring in, you know, the experts and Lucene to the rescue. Took a look at the data structure and we're just doing it all wrong. So, let's hit the books. And we find BKD, um, this was back, I mean, we're talking a few years ago now. So relatively new in the sense of Lucene land, right? 2015, 2016, I, I think, is when BKD first landed inside of Lucene. That would have been Lucene 6, if I remember right. 
Uh, so how does the block KD tree structure work? So B, B and BKD stands for block, not binary. Um, so that's always a question that I get. And the reason that that's important is because Lucene's data structures on disk are big block structures. They're really easy to move around. They're memory mapped into large blocks, right? So, um, so we wanted something, a spatial data structure, or really a numeric data structure, that would fit within that block concept of Lucene segments. And so how does this work? Well, now let's sneeze on the monitor again and take all those points and let's divide it up. And what we do is it's no different than an R tree. We're going to encapsulate by bounding rectangles, then slice based on the data that comes in. So we try to evenly slice it out as much as possible. You try to avoid adversarial uh, rectangles that are really thin because then you, your, your idea is if you can partition the space as evenly as possible, you can traverse the tree at the same complexity of each of the leaf nodes. So, um, so that's, it's, you know, multi-way, height-balanced tree, effectively. Um, so this is where we look at, um, you know, it's similar to just a, uh, like a MongoDB index or text-based. So I'm going to take all the spatial data and break it down into letters here. And you can see that our root node is the bounding rectangle of all of those points. And then we divide it out into internal nodes or how the space is partitioned. And then here we have our actual leaf nodes, which in points is going to be a y, x value encoded leaf value. Um, so this is an actual example that I think uh, Mike McCandless had put together when we first got it working for points only. Um, so you can see kind of around the London area, you see the, the point density increase. So you see the tree density increase because it's actually, the key here is it's driven by the data as opposed to the terms dictionary and the postings list, which is not really driven by the data. That's, it, it's driven by the space partitioning. Cool, so what about geoshapes? Well, let's look at a, I, my little uh, synthetic polygon here, which I did in, on purpose because they're diagonals. And, and if you know anything about computer graphics, drawing a line on a diagonal uses a more complex algorithm, Brushingham's line drawing, right? So we have to pick which pixel that we're going to actually cross. So they're very adversarial, very complex, and you end up with a lot of data. So let's take a very simple eight vertex polygon in a one degree by one degree spatial coverage area, and let's make the tree at a maximum of three meters quad cell resolution. You end up with 1.1 million terms in the terms dictionary. Uh, which is insane because each of those have to be stored as eight bytes, uh, for, actually, yeah, eight bytes on disk. So multiply that out, do the math, and you're spending a lot of money on AWS, which I'm sure AWS is happy about, but you're not. Um, and you're at three meters. So if you do a spatial query, you're at the mercy of three meter slop, and you get false positives, false negatives. If you have any kind of high resolution requirements in your project, forget it. You're going to spend a lot of money on disk storage. Um, so Let's look at it in tessellation. I jumped ahead a little bit here, so I uncovered the, the big bang there a bit. But, so if we look at it, we're going to tessellate the triangle using the same approach that computer graphics use for rendering on your PlayStation, but also the same one that Mapbox uses inside of their tessellation. So it's, well, similarly, it's a, a more optimized, improved one specifically for, excuse me, Lucene, but it's built on top of the same white papers that Mapbox had implemented. And we can see here that the spatial resolution for, is actually based on the encoding on disk, because we still have bytes that we have and bits we have to deal with. So our resolution is 1.1 centimeters, and we go from 1.1 million to eight terms. That's a compression ratio of 138,000 to one. Pretty, pretty impressive when you start looking at performance on disk, and you know, your S3 buckets are not as big as they were for one shape. So we're happy. <clears throat> Now we have to encode that into a binary representation. So I showed you, you have an internal node, or so is there a root node, an internal node. Uh, the key here is we took a polygon and we broke it down into a stream of triangles, which is key, right? So when you look at your graphics card, how's everything measured? Well, in the number of triangles it can render per second, right? And graphics cards are getting better, and your PlayStation 5 has better graphics than your PlayStation 4 and 3. So it's the same concept here, right? So we're going to stream out all of our triangles. Why do we do triangles? Well, because the cross product can tell us an orientation of a point with a triangle. It's very cheap to compute how a point intersects with a triangle, so collision detection is, is cheap. Um, <clears throat> So we want to do the same thing inside of Lucene. We take all of these triangles. We need an encoding for that triangle at the leaf node, some way to break it down into a binary representation. 
So this is getting a little bit into the implementation details, but the important takeaway here is that it all gets boiled, a triangle gets boiled down into a seven dimension point. And so what we do is we have this concept of index dimensions and data dimensions. Index dimensions drive the construction of the tree. Data dimensions is really nothing but a way to reconstruct the triangle. So I have my minimum and my maximum x, y, and then I have a one byte sort of header here to say, well, if I'm sharing the upper right, I'm gonna encode that as one, one, lower left is zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one. This is gonna tell me that the triangle is gonna share that corner of the original bounding rectangle, so just grab that part of the rectangle as the first point. And then I'm gonna flip the bits of x and y. So I flip the bit of, of uh, let's say here, the first one, flip the bit from one, and then uh, take zero as the minimum x, and then the y value is 5.1. So that's how I get that point back. Take the minimum x, 5.1, same for the y, uh, for the next point. I flip the bit, I take the minimum y value, and 3.1 becomes x. Now, boom, in seven dimensions, I can bring back the actual triangle without loss of data. I then insert that into my tree as the leaf node. Now all of my queries are broken down to, this is just Northeast Texas, happens to be where I'm from, so no coincidence there. I tessellated all of the county data from all of Texas, and it, sub, it was actually uh, about a five milliseconds to tessellate. And then I go through, and then an arbitrary polygon, I do basically triangle intersections. And because it's a our rectangle-driven tree, I split things out and, and I can ignore big swaths of that tree. So here's the performance. You can track this on, just look up Lucene Nightlies. And the key here, as you can see, we're making improvements every month or so. Like every other commit is dropping sort of the size of the index. And then the performance of index, the ingest rate is going up. Here's some key benchmarks here where you can see that shapes have hit basically the same performance as points. We get good performance numbers back from users, um, 25 to 30 times faster on indexing. Something that was 16 gig, using 16 gig heap, now runs in less than a second, and then all those parameters go away. Where are we going next? Well, we actually already have XY shape for arbitrary XY ge Cartesian geometries. This is for like internal mapping and non-worldly coordinates, and then we're going to other coordinate systems. I have very little time here, so I don't go into details on the aggregations, but I did want to show you what's new in 9.4. Uh, aggregations is the analytics portion of this, and in Lucene, we use a different data structure. We use something called doc values, with it, which is columnar stride, basically. Um, and so, as of Lucene 9.3, these are the numeric doc value for, formats. We, until 9.4, we didn't have one for shapes, and so you couldn't run any aggregations or analytics in solar. Um, at all without this format. Lucy 9.4 introduced this. This is relatively hot off the press. How does that work? Well, we take a shape, we break it down into a series of triangles, and then for that one shape, we come up with basically a depth first search serialized version of it. So all we're doing is we're breaking it down into a single dimensional byte array of that tree where you have the root node as the first block, left subtree, right subtree, and then we can traverse uh, in that on disk representation of that doc value format. Uh, so these are some examples of elastic searches, use of aggregation. So I don't have to go into too much detail because this is all in their documentation. It's the same for open search. Elastic search has some really nice new aggregations that they're adding. Um, uh, so you can see all the documentation on those. And uh, so, but anyway, just to touch on a few. Geodistance aggregation, it's sort of like break down into your targets and bucket those based on uh, distance, in this case, 30 units to th uh, 230 and then 120, actually I think that's wrong, 120 to 210. But yeah, so it's a, it's a target. Same thing, GeoGrid, this is how you can do all of your heat map representations. Precision is nothing but the depth of the tree. There's tile grid. GeoGrid was working on old school geo hashes that were not Mercator. Geo tile, a tile grid is Mercator, so it aligns nicely with your map. And then centroid, we can aggregate based on the centroids. Um, and then a few others out there that are not specifically geo, but are really useful is starting to break them down into normalized cross-correlation and covariance, which if you do any spatial analytics, those are the foundational uh, statistics you need uh, to do um, um, other geospatial like clustering, Geddes-Ord, Moran's Eye, all depend on those. Also, spatial reduction, 
and sampling uses cor correlation and cross covariance. So this is just sort of an example of doing correlation and cross covariance. Some new next ones coming: principal component analysis, and then, some, like I mentioned, Moran's eye and get a sword. So lots of content in there for you. Um, you happy to talk a little bit here and take some questions? But other than that, you know, follow the Lucene projects online. Look up the benchmarks, and you can, like, like everybody else, we look for committers, people that want to help improve it. Thank you, Nicolas.